The Global Conservation Corps presents the Rhino Man podcast. I'm John Jerko, your host and one of the directors of Rhino Man the Movie. This podcast series is a way for me to interview top conservationists on the topics of rhinos, the poaching crisis, the importance of rangers, and community engagement. All as a way to create awareness around these issues and to promote the coming release of our documentary film. In this episode, I'm talking with Dr. Barney Long. Barney received his Bachelor's of Science in Zoology at the University of Bristol and his PhD in Biodiversity Management at the Durrell Institute of Conservation and Ecology, University of Kent at Canterbury. For years, Barney led the species program at WWF, starting his career in Southeast Asia, exploring the region during baseline biodiversity inventory surveys and searching for presumed extinct primates. Barney is now the Senior Director of Conservation Strategies at Rewild, where he works on the conservation of endangered mammal species and the thematic approaches required to achieving the recovery of their populations. In this conversation, we talk about Barney's childhood dream to work in the rainforest, some of his early days in the field, an unexplainable experience with a local guide, and his passion for the Sumatran and Javan rhinos. We dive deep into the complex and daring attempts being made to bring the Sumatran rhinos back from the brink of extinction. We explore the many lost species and lesser-known creatures on the edge, and how Rewild is partnering with people from around the world who have a passion for saving their local wildlife. So many unbelievable stories ahead, so without further ado, here's my wide-ranging conversation with Dr. Barney Long. All right, welcome to the show, Barney. So good to have you on the Rhino Man podcast. It's been a while. Yeah, it's great to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I feel like I've been saying this a lot lately, but I feel like we first met at the World Ranger Congress, which is a, a pretty interesting event. I don't, is that your first time going there, or have you been there multiple times? That was my second World Ranger Congress, actually. Yeah, it gets bigger every time, and it's uh, more diverse, and great to see so many people turning up to it all the time now. Yeah, absolutely. You get to meet so many interesting people from all around the world. So let's start out with what you're doing right now. What's your title? What's kind of your day-to-day? You don't have to go into too much detail. We'll do that later, but just give people a sense of what you're up to. So I am officially the Senior Director of Conservation Strategies at Rewild. What that basically means is I oversee all of our thematic approaches rather than focus work in a specific geography. I work on the bodies of work that are global. So that includes all of our species conservation efforts, all of our work on species assessments, uh, red listing and green status of species work as well as our work on trade, protected area management, wildlife crime prevention, things like that. Yeah, so it sounds like it's pretty high-level stuff. Very interesting and very diverse. It's fantastic. (laughs) That's awesome. Yeah, I want to kind of work our way towards that, and then we can dive more into uh, what you're up to with Rewild. But I'd love to kind of take us back a step and how you got into this. Where were you growing up? How did you get into conservation? What were some of the, the first things that got you attracted to this field? I'm uh, originally from the UK, and I was one of those annoying kids that always knew what he wanted to do (laughs) for some reason, and I don't know why, but I always wanted to work in the rainforest. Mm. And so as I grew up, always thinking about going to the rainforest, when I was about 16, I started thinking about a career in the rainforest and I realized that I'd never actually been to the rainforest (laughs) and would I actually enjoy it if I went. So I spent a couple of years writing off to people over the world. This is pre-email. So I was writing letters, (laughs) um, trying to become a volunteer between finishing school and going to university. And thankfully, one very amazing woman allowed me to join her in Sumatra, in Mm. Indonesia. So as soon as I finished school at 18, I got on a plane and backpacked through Sumatra to meet up with her and spent the summer working with her on primates and tiger surveys and got invited back. So I went back the next two years each summer during university. And then after university finished, I was part of a rhino expedition to northern northern Sumatra looking for the Sumatran rhino. So by the time I'd finished university, I'd been to Indonesia four times and had a pretty good network of contacts and knowledge, much more than I learned at university. (laughs) (laughs) So it always works. And so, yeah, it just went from there. Judging by who you know, you managed to get the next job. And and, yeah, I, I spent two periods in Cambodia doing baseline biodiversity surveys. I spent nearly 10 years in Vietnam doing species conservation work, protected area management, landscape conservation efforts. 
and then got invited to come over to the US where I'm based now to, to run the initially the Asian species program for WWF US and then eventually the species program for WWF US. And that's when I started working more globally on species conservation. But my big passion has always been the more forgotten and overlooked species. And so mm-hmm. even though I, I loved working with WF and I, I loved working on tigers and pandas and, and elephants and, and whatnot, my real passion is for the species that no one's ever even heard of. And yeah. so I moved over to Rewild about six years ago to start a species program for them. And now we've got a body of work across the world that really does support those species that are completely neglected frogs, small mammals, freshwater fish, things like this, that most of the larger conservation groups are not really focusing on. And, you know, much more challenging in terms of fundraising for a small little fish or a rat. But there's always really passionate local partners working uh, to conserve these species that are really glad to have an international partner and Mm. Uh, supporter networker so um it's really really rewarding working on those kind of species yeah yeah that's great i mean i feel like you covered a lot in a short time there but kind of going back i mean what you know you said you'd never been to the rainforest how did you know you wanted to to go there did you do you remember seeing it in films or books or it just like came to you (laughs) (laughs) i i i wish i knew to be honest (laughs) We did a big family trip when I was four and and I kept a scrapbook and every single page is animals and Mm. postcards of the forest and things like this where we'd been. And it just seems to have been something that was, I don't know where it came from. Like we didn't go to zoos regularly. I did read a series of books when I was a kid based on a zoo collector that would go out and collect animals for zoos. And I loved uh, reading those books, Mm. but not all of those books were set in the rainforest. So yeah, I I really don't know where it came from, but it was just something I've always loved the idea of the sheer biodiversity and the wonder and the size of rainforests. And yeah, thankfully, I actually enjoy what my (laughs) uninformed passion was. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's so interesting. So when you you had that that summer where you went went to uh, Asia, but What was your plan in terms of studies at that time? So I planned to study zoology, which I did. But at that time, my my interest really was doing research. I really wanted to do radio tracking of elusive small carnivores in the rainforest that, again, no one has ever really heard of and certainly no one has ever studied. So that was my initial plan. And I actually got accepted to do a PhD on that. Thankfully, I never actually raised the money to do it because my life would have been very different if I'd have gone down that route. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I saw you, um, your undergrad was at Bristol, University of Bristol. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah. I studied zoology at Bristol. It was a fantastic city and, and an amazing course. Really, really enjoyed it. Yeah. I spent one night there. I, I recall on the way back from, I don't know if you ever went to the Glastonbury Music Festival, but I went there one year with uh, my sister and her boyfriend at the time. And then I think we spent a night in Bristol and I remember having a nice English breakfast in the morning, but it seemed like a really, really cool city. (laughs) It is a really, really cool city. Yeah. If I ever move back to the UK, I'll certainly be close to Bristol. Yeah. Lovely part of the world. Really enjoyed it. Really enjoyed the university there. So yeah, very, again, very focused. I knew what I wanted to do. I didn't want to do biology. I wanted to do zoology. Mm -hmm. I'm really glad I did it. It was a great course and really set me up for, for my career. What's the difference for people that don't know? between zoology and biology? Zoology is is the study of animals, whereas biology is is everything. So I I did study botany in my first year, as well as zoology. I also did a little bit of paleontology, but really I knew that it was animals that I wanted to focus on. So I specialized as soon as I could, which isn't always the best thing to do, but in my case, I knew what I wanted. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it seemed like you, uh, you, you were set. You knew where you were going. Yeah, <laughs> somehow. <laughs> but when you got to the rainforest the first time, I don't know if you can recall any of those experiences. What was that like just getting in there for the first time and experiencing it being on the ground in the field doing the work? That's a good question. You know, the the rainforest is so different to anything else you could ever imagine. It's possibly the most uncomfortable place on the planet. <laughs> and so you really do have to enjoy it. But I think for me the the thing that just kept me there and kept me wanting to come back is 
it's so diverse. Literally everywhere you look, there's something interesting, whether it's a weird shaped leaf or a a little insect or a sound that you've not heard before. Mm-hmm. It's just absolutely incredible. And, and every new place you go, you're confronted with tens of thousands of different species that you've not been exposed to before. And so you can just never, ever get bored. And it's, I also like the fact that it is a forest. So it's, it's hard to see, it's hard to navigate. You don't see the species you're interested in that regularly. So it's, it's an effort. So when you do see things, you really have to kind of take it in and absorb it. Don't get me wrong. I love going on safari in Africa and sitting in a car and watching mm-hmm. lions or whatever it is. But <laughs> that that feeling of walking for days, searching for a monkey and finally seeing one is there's a lot more satisfaction than having to really work to see something. Yeah. And that detective work of trying to figure out where it would be and how you can see it without scaring it, etc. Your brain just constantly has to work. I really enjoy that. Yeah. What was that, some of that er, first or early work like? I mean, kind of your day to day, what were you doing out there in terms of re- research, collecting data? It was a whole mix of things. And, and because I was young, I was trying to do little side projects all the time. So there was quite a lot of sitting down, talking to local communities, which is an absolutely critical part of, of conservation, understanding what they think and feel about the location and the, the animals within it. There was a lot of foot survey, so literally trudging around the forest day after day, looking for footprints, listening for things. One year I helped a a primate researcher that works on vocalizations. So I was recording gibbon and, and leaf monkey calls. So getting up very early in the morning and going out before it got light, waiting for for dawn and recording calls as as dawn broke. Another year I wanted to learn more about the small mammals. So I took a load of small mammal traps out and did some live trapping to see what different rats and mice were in the area where the the main camp was. So a whole load of different things, which was great because it built up my skills in a whole suite of different areas, but also just got me interested in all the different types of, of animals. That was extremely rewarding. And again, you could spend a lifetime in one part of one rainforest learning everything that's there so yeah just kind of being a young sponge soaking it all up yeah was it dangerous just walking into the rainforest i mean i know like in the african bush if you don't know what's if it's your first time there you don't want to just wander off without any knowledge (laughs) otherwise you're probably not going to last too long but is is there anything like that in terms of wildlife or did you have to kind of learn how to respect different parts of the forest yeah, I, I was always with the local guide and, and they are always so knowledgeable that local indigenous knowledge is critical when you're a foreigner working in any place, to be honest, not just rainforest. So I learned a huge amount from them. But yeah, you have to be careful, to be honest. I think that probably the biggest threat in somewhere like mountainous rainforest is actually just getting lost. <laughs> it's not easy to navigate we didn't have handheld GPSs then, we do these days. So it was all map and compass, plus obviously the knowledge of your local guide. Mm-hmm. So that's one of the biggest problems. Obviously, there's snakes, there's scorpions, there's stinging centipedes, there's tigers, there's elephants. So yes, there's dangers around. You have to be careful all the time. But I think if you treat the forest and its inhabitants with the right respects, you should be mm-hmm. safe. <laughs> And then again, always leaning on the the local knowledge is is absolutely key. I don't think we as visitors can ever be experts in these forested areas. We might know quite a lot about one individual species, but it's these local Mm -hmm. people that are the true experts and and know the forest, know the mountains, know the, the general suite of species out there that can be dangerous which includes plants you know some plants sting <laughs> some plants can even kill you if you if the sap gets on you etc so you literally have to know everything about everything and you can only do that if it's an intergenerational knowledge being passed down yeah do you have any memories of something that kind of blew your mind in terms of some of the knowledge that someone had that you were with or just like i don't know something that kind of just caught you off guard maybe There was one incident, which to be honest, I still can't explain, 
I think it was expert local knowledge, but other people might interpret it differently. But I was out with a local dukun, so the kind of local spiritual leader, magic man, however you want to shame and however you want to, to phrase it. And it started to rain quite heavily. So he quickly got some stuff out of his backpack, made a, a little fire and burnt some incense and said a prayer for want of a better phrase and said, just stay with me and don't worry, you won't get rained on. And then we walked back to camp and the forest was soaking wet, but we did not get rained on the whole time. And as soon as we got back to camp, he said, don't leave camp because you'll get rained on, just stay in camp. But we'd actually just seen something. So we both, I was with someone else, we, we snuck back out of mm -hmm. camp to see if we could see what we were looking for. And as soon as we left camp, we got absolutely rained on. <laughs> so so you interpret that whichever way you want to interpret it. <laughs> but it was definitely something to this day. I was, I'm absolutely flabbergasted on how they did that, whether it was magic or just really amazing knowledge of local weather patterns yeah. and things like that. But I cannot yeah. explain it. Yeah, it's definitely something that sticks with you. Huh? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> So because of the nature of, you know, the film we're getting ready to release in the near future here, Rhino Man, you know, I'd love to talk to you about Sumatran and Javan rhinos, which you have a lot of experience with. You know, I've, from the work with the film and and most of the, the people I've talked with, I, I'm mainly connected more with the African rhinos, so black rhinos and white rhinos. But maybe, I don't know if, if there's one or the other you want to start with, Javan or, or Sumatran, but... Yeah, I'd love to learn more about them and and what the differences are and kind of what the status of their existence is right now. Yeah, thanks for asking about that. And I think the the first thing to to let people know is is that there are rhinos in Asia. <laughs> That's definitely <laughs> the the main topic here. There are five species of rhinos in the world, three of which are in Asia. So the greater one horned or the Indian rhino in India, Nepal, Bhutan. And then, yeah, which we saw at the World Ranger Congress. I don't know if you caught a glimpse. Absolutely, but yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And then you have the Sumatran and the Javan rhino, both of which these days are restricted to Indonesia, although historically were found over a much wider area, and both of which are right on the edge of extinction. So we talk a lot about the poaching crisis in Africa and how threatened rhinos are to poaching, and that is all absolutely accurate. But the level of threat and the, the closeness to extinction just does not compare between the African rhinos and the Asian rhinos. So even though there is a lot of poaching going on in Africa, you still have 5,000 odd black rhinos, 20,000 white rhinos. There are less than 80 Sumatran rhinos, and there are around 74, 75 Javan rhinos. So you're talking two orders of magnitude difference in terms of numbers. And you're talking as two species that are really on the edge and need a lot more attention and a lot more international support than they currently get. Mm -hmm. So very briefly, the Sumatran rhino was found across Southeast Asia parts of Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, Thailand, Malaysia, and then across Sumatra and Borneo, but has been slowly disappearing from across those ranges over the last 40, 50 years. So they were reported in Cambodia in the late 1990s, for example. I did surveys for them in mm. 2000, 2001, and they probably disappeared five to 10 years earlier. I got records from local community members in Vietnam that they were probably there 20 years previously. The last ones from Peninsular Malaysia disappeared in the 2010s. The last animal was known to disappear from Sabah in Borneo, Malaysia, just a few years ago. And so now you literally only have them living in Kalimantan and Sumatra in Indonesia. So we've, we've been witnessing this extinction from country to country to country over the last few years. And so now we're down to this very small number. And with Sumatrans, they are still found in multiple locations. So even though we say less than 80 animals, 
We don't actually know how many there are. They're very hard to find. There could be a few more, it's highly likely a few less, Mm -hmm. but they're (laughs) spread across large areas and in multiple different locations. And that in itself is one of the problems because they are not meeting each other. Many of the individuals Mm -hmm. are not meeting each other and therefore not breeding. And so you can go into this more detail later, but one of the big issues is how do you bring animals together to actually make sure you have the second the next generation of Sumatran rhinos. So low numbers, but very scattered. The Javan rhino is a slightly different situation. It actually used to have a much larger distribution than the Sumatran rhino. It went all the way up to Northeast India. It's very closely related to the Indian greater one-horned rhino. So the Javan or the lesser one-horned rhino, they did potentially overlap or at least meet each other up in Assam, Northeast India, They're across the Sundarbans and all of mainland Southeast Asia. In the late 1990s, a small population was found in southern Vietnam, but the the last one there was shot in 2010. So they are now found in a single park on Java in Indonesia. So very different to the Sumatran rhinos because they're all found in the same place. Mm -hmm. But that brings with it its own set of threats because all your eggs are in one basket so if something happens to Mm -hmm. that basket (laughs) you don't have Mm -hmm. any other eggs so even though they're both very small numbers they have very very different conservation problems yeah yeah and i don't know if you can give a little bit of a a word description i know people can look them up but in comparison to the white rhino and the black rhino can you talk a little bit about their size what they look like maybe you know, how they eat and, and some of those aspects? Sure. So the, the Javan rhino, like I say, is very similar to the Indian rhino, which is, which is more known to people. It's smaller than the African species, but much more armor plated. It's like a walking tank. It has very <laughs> bony plates on its shoulders. And so looks a bit like it's kind of come out of some fantasy war movie. <laughs> <laughs> they are pretty solitary, um, but do have overlapping home ranges. Very much a browser, so walks around the forest, has a bit of a prehensile upper lip, will be picking leaves off trees, etc. Likes to to wallow as well, not uh, wallow in water. It likes to be called off with the the water in wallows and rivers, et cetera. The Sumatran rhino is much smaller still. It's the smallest of all the species. It has two horns, but they're generally pretty small, sometimes no more than a bump, the second horn at least. (laughs) And they are hairy, pretty brown. (laughs) Actually, the Sumatran rhino is more closely related to the extinct woolly rhinos than it is to any of the Mm. four other living rhino species. So they're very small and hairy and probably the cutest of the rhino species, if if a rhino (laughs) can be cute. And they also are very solitary, also a browser, uh, also very dependent on wallows as well. And they sing. They have a very cute little high-pitched wail, which they use to communicate. And I think it's the only rhino known to to really call it singing, but vocalize in that way. Yeah. So yeah, the, the Sumatran rhino is very, very different than any of the other rhino species. So if you don't know what they look like, it's definitely worth checking them out. Yeah, I saw, was it like a couple of years ago, one of the the little ones that was born. It's a pretty cute image. I don't know, it was Delilah, is that the name? You might re- remember. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, super cute. What's What's the cause of the loss of these two rhino species? Is it poaching? Is it Habitat loss is a combination. What's I don't know if they have different stories or if they're kind of similar. So I think historically they start with the same story. We're talking a thousand, two thousand years of very low level poaching for horns for traditional uses. So over centuries they've been targeted by humans across their range. That will have helped depress their already pretty low densities. They're naturally quite low density species. Then you start getting into the colonial periods um, where there was a lot of hunting Mm -hmm. and there's records of teams going in and hunting multiple rhinos in a 
weekend away. <laughs> that could easily have led to local extirpations in specific locations. We don't know. We're just mm-hmm. hypothesizing here, but could easily have have done that. You know, if, if someone's taking out 13 rhinos in a week, it's highly likely that they extirpate rhinos from that area, whether they would be able to recover between I just don't know. So it's 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 mm. highly likely that some of those colonial hunts were leading, driving local extirpations. You also had in at least for the Javan rhino during colonial periods, there was a bounty on their head because the Javan rhino was seen as a crop pest in rice paddies. And so the Dutch colonists actually put a bounty on their head and, and there was more than one rhino were killed per day over one a one year period. So there was again. Back then, how much of an impact would 300, 400 rhinos take? We don't know, Mm -hmm. but it's highly likely that that was, again, depressing populations further. After that, you could get into the big period of major deforestation and and loss of most of the lowland habitats, which the rhinos would have preferred. So that's when you start seeing major population declines across their range. But I think once you start getting into the last 50-odd years, the two main drivers then are poaching for the illegal wildlife trade for the horns, combined mm-hmm. with the alley effect, which is basically when populations start getting too small, they can't recover. You start getting inbreeding because it's closely related animals starting to mm-hmm. breed. Maybe they just are not meeting each other in the forest. And so what you're seeing then is a series of local extirpations of large bodies of forest with rhinos in mainly then you get large bit of forest with few rhinos in then the forest shrinks then you're left with small isolated subpopulations which are very vulnerable to poaching and inbreeding Mm. and alley effect type issues and that's when you start seeing these animals just blinking out landscape by landscape country by country And so what we've got now is the last little fragments of those blink outs and so the question is, how do you prevent those blink outs from continuing <laughs> and leading to yeah. the extinction versus putting them onto a path where they can actually recover? When did we become aware that they were getting so close to the brink? Was this in the last 10, 20 years? Or has it been a while that we've been kind of watching the populations? I would say it was about 10, 10 years ago. I think we've always known Sumatran rhinos, for example, we've always known, well, always, for the last 30 years, we've known that there's very few animals in very few places. But what we didn't really understand is that when we knew there was rhinos in an area, how few there were. It's been really interesting to realize that we always overestimated the population. Oh, there's 15 animals here, there's 30 there. And then suddenly we can't Mm. see them anymore and they've gone. So it probably wasn't 30 or 15. It was probably two or Mm. three. So I don't, it's only really been in the last 10 years that we've realized just how dire it is because we were working off kind of blind guesses for a long time as to how many animals there were in Mm -hmm. each site. So now we're getting a much better handle on that. We know exactly how many Javan rhinos there are because we put in a monitoring system about 10 years ago. Sumatrans we're getting, we've been doing the last three years, really intensive surveys to identify individual rhinos. So, yeah, we've got a much better handle on it now, but it was really only uh, about 10 years ago that the whole conservation community came together and was like, business as usual is not going to save these animals. We have to do something different. Mm -hmm. Do you remember how you got involved with these species specifically and, and what was some of your work connected to them? So the Sumatran rhino, on one of my very first trips to the rainforest in Sumatra when I was wanting to go out and and radio track small carnivores for a living, (laughs) I actually came across the skeleton of a poached rhino still lying underneath the snare in which it was killed in. And that, for me, was an absolute pivotal moment because that day I decided I didn't want to do research. I wanted to do conservation. And so for me, the Sumatran rhino is a personal story You know, I was probably 18 or 19 at the time and my career trajectory changed because of this species. So after that, I didn't really get to work on it for many, many years. I did do a few surveys in Vietnam and Cambodia trying to to find remnant populations and stuff, but they were all kind of 
on the side for what I was being paid to do. Mm-hmm. It wasn't really until I moved to WF US and was running their Asian species program that I was able to start supporting the government of Indonesia and WF Indonesia and partners to really work on the conservation strategies and programs for the species then. That was about 15 years ago. So this was kind of at that moment where everyone was starting to realize like we need to step it up, otherwise we're going to lose them. Yes, yes. Yeah, just slightly after that, a few years after that, we started realizing, you know, a few really insightful people started seeing this and then, you know, a few more people would pick up on it and, and eventually the whole community came around to agreeing that, yeah, you know, we've been... We've been a little bit delusional. We thought there was more than there were, and we need to do very different strategies given this new situation. For Java Rhino, it was a slightly different. I was working in Vietnam, and WBF Vietnam were working on the, the Java Rhino there. I was not working in the same area, but I got asked to start helping advise on it and realized some of the key things that needed to be done. And so when I then moved to WFUS, was able to leverage the funding to actually make those things happen. And that's when we went out and started doing the detailed surveys to find out exactly how many there were and detail the the threats to it. And it was actually during those surveys that the last rhino was, was poached. And we were actually able to document that and a really clearly identify that there was only one rhino there. And historically, how many rhinos have been there over the last few years through a whole load of different mechanisms. So I kind of got into it when I was in Vietnam. And then again, when I was at WWF US, was able to start supporting WF Indonesia and and the Indonesian government um, from afar. And when I moved over to to Rewell, one of the conditions of me moving over was that I I was able to keep Sumatran and Java and Rhino projects going <laughs> um, because they've just become <laughs> a passion of mine. I can't imagine yeah. working in this field and not helping the partners in Indonesia work on these two species. So yeah, it's been it's been a while now that I've been working on both of these species. So what's it look like moving forward? I mean, what are some of the strategies to try and and save these species and increase the populations? I mean, it's it sounds like it's kind of a daunting task from the outside, but what are what are some of the steps that you're all trying to make? Yeah, daunting is one word for it. They're very different strategies. So again, I'll, I'll take it one by one. So for the Sumatran rhino, very few animals, very dispersed individuals, an aging population probably. And so if these animals don't breed, we will be en- we'll end up with one small population in the wild. And so for a couple of decades, there's been a breeding program in Indonesia at Wakambas National Park run by the Indonesian Rhino Foundation, the International Rhino Foundation and the Indonesian government. And that has been successful in having three calves over the last few years. The latest one was literally three or four weeks ago. And so that has kind of proved that we can breed rhinos in captivity. It's the breeding center there is semi-wild. So it's it's in its enclosures in the natural rainforest. And they have a fantastic system there. And, and huge kudos to those three institutions for getting that established and, and figuring out how to breed these rhinos in captivity, helped by some key international partners, especially. Cincinnati Zoo, who have, have been fantastic at figuring out the how to breed these animals. So a few years ago, an international coalition came together around the Sumatran rhino to think about how we deal with this idea that we have these isolated rhinos that are not breeding. And so this coalition formed and invested in a new program, which is in full support of the Indonesian government's emergency action plan for Sumatran rhinos. So the idea is to find and rescue all of these rhinos that are not meeting other rhinos and having babies and bring them into a breeding program, a single national breeding program. And so in addition to this site that has been operational for a couple of decades, we are currently constructing another identical site uh, in another location 
And a couple of years ago, we built a smaller centre in Kalimantan in Borneo as well. And the idea is to find and rescue these animals and bring them into these semi-wild breeding programmes so that we can actually have pregnancies and babies. So that's the plan. We are working through a partnership of multiple local Indonesian conservation organisations, working very closely with the Indonesian government, who is obviously this is their programme, it's support of their emergency action plan, but how all of these different partners can come together to implement an extremely complicated, expensive, logistically horrific (laughs) programme. (laughs) Um, we're talking, you know, we're currently following multiple individual rhinos and we're hoping to capture some rhinos this year and next year to bring into the breeding program. Some of these rhinos are up to 10 days walk from the local village. So you can imagine how hard it is to find these rhinos, sort out the logistics in mountainous rainforest when it that far away from from the nearest road or village so it's very complicated but we have fantastic support from the indonesian government amazing set of local partners and a really dedicated set of international partners and advisors so hopefully we'll be able to pull this off and over the next few years start pairing up these rhinos and and hopefully we'll start having a lot more babies in the coming 10 years But time is really against us. Like I say, lots of these animals are are getting older. Rhinos live, Sumatran rhinos live to about 35 maximum. These rhinos are probably all 20 years old plus. So do the maths. Time is running out. When rhinos don't breed, they do get reproductive tract pathologies, which makes getting pregnant much harder. As we catch each rhino, we need to understand whether it can breed naturally or not. If it can, there's a race against time because a pregnancy is 16 months. The baby will be with the mother for three to four years. So every single female that's caught, if we can get one baby out of her, that would be fantastic. If we can get two, it would be a miracle. So you can imagine if you start doing the maths here, we have eight animals, nine animals in captivity at the moment in the breeding program. One or two of them might be possibly not reproductively viable anymore. Lots of them are pretty closely related. So we need the new genetics to come in. But just do the maths. Even if we catch yeah. six, seven animals, if we, we've got to get enough babies in the next five, 10 years before those animals age out, therefore you're then left with a small population of young animals from which to recover the entire species from. So time is really, really of the essence. And with a complicated project, time ticks away very quickly. And with a species which is very little known, um, there's so much attention on African rhinos, pretty much no attention on the Asian species. It's very hard to fundraise for this project. As you can imagine, it's a very expensive project um, when you're having to airlift rhinos out of rainforest with helicopters and things like that so it's a ambitious high stakes project but one that i still do believe that we can be successful on because as i said our partners on the ground government partners are all pulling in the same direction on this and and that's the key i think over the last five years everyone has got behind a single plan and we're all pulling in the same direction and we just need to figure out how to speed this up and how to implement it and how to fund it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it really sounds almost like the the Mission Impossible action movie of saving a rhino species. I mean, the clock is ticking. Like, yeah, as, as you're explaining that, I mean, I'm thinking about in South Africa, you know, just trying to capture and release rhinos there is a huge logistical feat. But you're in this open savanna, whereas like you're saying, you got to hike 10 miles into a rainforest, mountainous rainforest, and then try and capture this rhino and then fly it out. And then all the other crazy logistics that you just spoke of in terms of pregnancies and all of that. So yeah, it's pretty epic feat that you're going after, which is amazing. It is. It is a very ambitious project. I'm a huge believer though in if a species has a chance, we should throw everything at it to make sure it has a 
proper chance of survival and recovery and absolutely nowhere near being a lost cause yet and so if we can if we can find the right level of support we can do this we have the right expertise we're working with with people who have done helicopter evacuations in south africa we we're working with people who have caught rhinos sumatran rhinos in the past we're working with the best people in the world for conservation breeding of rhinos we're also starting to work with the best people in the world on advanced reproductive technologies in case we do have rhinos that can't get pregnant how do we help them get pregnant etc so we do have the best people in the world on this project we don't have much time and we don't have much many resources so we need to break through those two barriers everything else is in place yeah absolutely uh, i mean playing the devil's advocate why is it worth saving this species or any species really because you know if you think about it the argument could be like well 99.9% of all species have you know gone extinct over the earth's time frame but why is it important for us now to save these species why does it matter to you every species is an important part of the web of life every species is the result of tens of millions of years of evolution as i said the sumatran rhino is more closely related to the woolly rhinos than any of the other four extant species of rhino and therefore represents a part of rhino being that none of the other rhinos represents it's truly unique if we start losing those really unique species think of it as an actual tree if you start cutting off all the outside branches <laughs> pretty soon you lose all the leaves and all you're left with is a dead christmas tree type thing <laughs> that's not a functioning thriving ecosystem and to me things like the sumatran rhino at the tip of the iceberg if, if we can't save them then we won't save the next wedge then we won't save the next part of the wedge and we won't save the next before you know it we are in ecosystem collapse and that leads to major issues for for humankind as well so I think you can very easily make a, an argument why each individual species counts from a human point of view but I also think personally that each individual species on this planet has just as much right to be here as we do and we have no right to willfully allow them to go extinct and so how do we write that we write that through active conservation and like I say this is not a lost cause we know how to do this so we have a moral responsibility to do it. Yeah, really well put. How do you see rangers kind of playing into this? I don't know if, if there's a specific role with these rhinos, you know, in South Africa, they play a huge role protecting the rhinos from the poaching crisis there. But what's your view of rangers and their role in conservation? Rangers are the complete unsung heroes of conservation, in my view. I think the image of a ranger especially when you talk about african rhinos is very much one of a paramilitary type approach to stop poaching most rangers around the world are not like that most rangers are they will they wear multiple hats they are community engagement experts they are educators they are biologists they are tourist guides etc cetera, etc cetera. and so rangers play a critical role in for sumatran and javan rhinos there are rangers out there doing anti-poaching patrols but it's a very different type of anti-poaching than africa because again the rangers aren't the, the poachers aren't going out and seeing rhinos and shooting them they would be out there for years so it's very much based on on setting traps and so the rangers in in indonesia don't necessarily need to be armed they're out there removing traps, educating, working with communities. We do a lot of, at Rewild, we really focus on crime prevention rather than anti-poaching. So that's a, a branch of, of science that actually comes out of uh, urban criminology about how you work with communities to make it socially unacceptable to engage in a crime. So rather than trying to catch the criminal, you're working with society to prevent the crime. That makes it a lot less personal and it's much more about building a better society. So take an urban crime example. 
if you are in a in a city area and there's graffiti everywhere and litter on the ground etc you automatically get into this mindset that maybe you know petty crime is okay and therefore you know it's okay for people to start doing slightly more dangerous crime go out into the suburbs where you have major neighborhood watch schemes police men and women coming into schools and talking to the kids and the boys scouts and the girl scouts and things like that litter graffiti smash windows petty crime is not accepted and therefore more serious crime is not accepted take that to the rainforest how do you work with communities to respect borders of parks to respect catch limits on fish all these kind of stuff if they start understanding and respecting the rules that everyone abides by and makes for a more equitable more just more caring society then if a rhino poacher from outside comes in and asks some local person to help go to find some rhinos they're automatically going to say no because that's not the environment within that they're living in and so we really try and focus on crime prevention obviously you still need patrolling to catch the bad apples that (laughs) work despite that so the rangers in indonesia are much more focused on community engagement education crime prevention engaging communities there is some some anti-poaching work as well obviously it's rangers that are involved in rhino surveys and and monitoring etc etc as well so the thing for me and rhinos is that they are doing multiple jobs many of which they're untrained to do or not trained enough to do but they often get portrayed as just one thing and i think that's very unfair on them because they are doing so many different roles and we need to recognize all of those roles and celebrate all those different roles because you cannot protect rhinos just through paramilitary approaches you cannot protect forest just by education it, you have to be doing all of those roles and rangers do all of those roles. Yeah. And I mean, even, even the rangers in South Africa that are doing a lot of that more paramilitary work, they also do do along with that, the community engagement, you know, the good, the good ones are doing community engagement. They're doing a lot of conservation efforts around the reserves. And I think that's a part of why this podcast is important because, you know, we're telling a very specific story in the film, but Like you said, these rangers around the world, I mean, you live in so many diverse ecosystems and, you know, are working in so many different roles around the world that we want to make sure we highlight that and the importance that they play in conservation at large. So I'm wondering if you have any memories of, you know, working with rangers or experiences in the field with a ranger where, you know, something that stood out to you of, I don't know if it's, you know, something where someone's gone above and beyond or just being surprised or touched by something that a ranger did? To be honest, rangers, I've worked with rangers in countries across multiple continents and, and they all stand out to me. Obviously, you have some rangers that are better than others, just like in, in any job, but <laughs> I've always been impressed with rangers. I think some of the some of the ranges I've been most impressed with are, are those that actually come from local indigenous groups. But going back to the conversation we had earlier about the, the knowledge of local indigenous people and forests, just that, that knowledge, when you can combine that traditional knowledge with the knowledge that a ranger has in terms of legislation and biology and, and things like that, you get a really, really powerful force. And they're able to communicate with so-called uneducated indigenous people as well as government officials as well as foreign conservationists and and have an articulate conversation with all those different stakeholders and and as much as anything else that i think is what's really impressive because to span those cultural differences those different concepts of conservation and biology of traditional knowledge etc that is really, really impressive. And it's it's rangers that can do that that really stand out to me. Yeah, absolutely. I saw that you were also very uh, close to the, uh, is it called Saola? Saola, yes. Saola. Yeah, and I, I feel like, is this the, it's like a type of antelope, right, that's in Vietnam? And I feel like I remember seeing when I was a kid, 
there were some like <laughs> bad videos of them or something where it was, is this the one that like people thought had gills or something like that, but turned out to be a gland or is that some other species? Oh, I feel like I'd never heard it described that way. <laughs> yeah. Um, I feel like I saw some bad like history channel video or something possibly, when I was young. <laughs> um, yeah. So it was like the guild yeah, antelope. The is, is actually a primitive bovid, so it's actually a relation of the cow, but it does look like an antelope. Okay. So initially, when it was discovered, it was like, is this an antelope? Is this a, a goat? Is this a cow? So we now know it's a, a primitive bovid, so more closely related to the Tamarau of Philippines or the Inoa of, of Indonesia than, than goats or antelopes. But yeah, that was discovered in 1992 in the Anamite Mountains of Vietnam. And yeah, I've been very closely involved in that, in its conservation since about 1999. And yes, it does have these very large glands on its face with a large flap. So I presume that's what you mean when someone mm -hmm. talked about it being gills. But no, <laughs> it's, a, it's a gland, which presumably they mark territories or communicate with other Salate in the forest by by using that and putting some sort of secretion from that gland on bent twigs or something in the forest to communicate with other salva. Yeah. So yeah, fascinating species, very similar to Sumatran rhino that it's down to very, very low numbers, definitely less than 100, probably less than 20. We, similarly to the Sumatran rhino, we're working to set up a conservation breeding program for it because it's probably in a similar situation where there's a few very small subpopulations of you know a handful of individuals scattered around the mountain range and so probably the only really way to to secure its future is away from poaching in a place where they can breed safely so we do believe conservation breeding is the only real short-term future for that species obviously longer term we will be wilded and put it back into the forest but yeah very very analogous to the Sumatran rhino and a, a program that we're we're working on with our Vietnamese colleagues at the moment. Yeah, it's still kind of incredible to me that like in the 90s is when this species was discovered and it's, you know, it's not a tiny little animal. It's a pretty good size. So. Exactly. Yeah. And I, I I remember being in my school library when it was discovered and reading a magazine about it. And I remember leaning over to my best friend who I was sat next to at the time saying, I'm going to work on this animal. This is amazing. And my first paid <laughs> position in conservation in Asia was actually working on this species. And I've been working on it ever since. In fact, if you can see behind me, there's a photo of it right behind my shoulder. Oh, yeah. So, yes, um, <laughs> uh, awesome. a species which is very close to my heart, along with this amount of mining. Yeah, it's another one of your early predictions of what you'd be doing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm tenacious of nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So let's let's talk a little bit more about what you're doing at Rewild currently. And you know, I've kind of been following just the Instagram even, and guys are putting out some amazing content around the search for lost species and all that you're talking about here. So I don't know if you want to go into more detail about some of the specific programs and and what that looks like and what you guys are where you're putting your resources. Sure. Well, as I said before, Rewild really focuses on the species that are overlooked and we often call them the underfrog species because we do so much work on amphibians. So we have programs of work on, on multiple groups of species that are, I would say, just as charismatic, but less well-known or appreciated, perhaps, is the way to say it. Mm -hmm. Probably the, the flagship project for all of this is the Search for Lost Species, which is an effort to crowdsource people all over the world to go look for species that have not been seen for over a decade. The idea of this is basically not to leave any species behind. Any species that has not been seen for a decade clearly does not have someone focusing on it, or if it does, it's a very, very rare species and needs extra help. And so we... An objective of that program is to catalyze conservation efforts for these species. So we find people that are or institutions that are interested in looking and, and for and working on these species, and we support them to establish search mechanisms and hopefully find them and establish conservation programs for the, mm. the species. This is also proving a really great way to launch new careers. You know, if you can imagine a student in a country without much 
conservation happening, we can help fundraise with them, uh, help mentor them, put them in touch with global experts on the species, help design search methods with them. If they find the species, we can help promote them and hopefully get them set up on a path where they are then working on the conservation of the species into the future. So it's a great program for engaging the world to care about the forgotten species. But like I say, lots of the other programs we work on are working on species that are not well known. We do a lot of work on amphibians, for example. We focus a lot on the harlequin toads, which is um, a, a genus of mm. toads that are found in primarily among, along the Andes. Absolutely stunningly beautiful amphibians. Mm. Lots of them have not been seen for a long time. Lots of them are right on the brink of extinction because of habitat destruction or disease. So trying to pull together networks of local partners across the range countries, see how we can support, mentor, catalyze work for these local partners to, to do the work. And we could replicate that for any number of species, freshwater fish or small mammals, mm -hmm. or even some of the, the primates, which, okay, there's a lot of people interested in working on primates, but some primate groups get completely mm -hmm. ignored. So we work on the red colobus, for example, which is a, a group of 18 taxa across Africa that are really an excellent example of a group of species that are overlooked, even though they share the forest with great apes and elephants and, and other things, they really are the best indicator for those species. It's the first large to get poached out of these forests, and yet people aren't monitoring them. So they're, they're not monitoring the best indicator species. So trying to, to build a network of local partners across forested Africa who are interested in working on these species, some of which are really critically endangered. The Niger Delta red colobus is down to around 200 individuals. Miss Waldron's red colobus in Cote d'Ivoire is potentially extinct. It's one of our lost species. If it is extinct, it will be the first primate extinction for about 500 years. So really important group of species, again, pretty much overlooked by the broader conservation community. So really trying to bring attention to those species that, that others are not working on. Yeah. I mean, you hear the numbers of the loss of populations of species and like percentages and things, you know, looking just kind of overall. But as you start to talk about it and like start mentioning specific species and even just the type of content that you're putting out at Rewild, you start seeing all these beautiful species and you're like, you know, it just kind of brings it home to how many there are that are coming close to the brink of being extinct or may have, may be extinct already. And we're trying to see if we can find them and save them. So it's, I think it's really incredible work, especially just the awareness side of it. To, you know, it's it's easy to have a, a big rhino or elephant or lion or something and and raise funds, but like you're saying, it's you know a, lo a lot of these other species that have kind of been forgotten. We need to find ways to bring awareness to them and and show how important they are as well. So absolutely, and 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 the key thing is, I think, is is one that there's people all over the world wanting to work on the conservation of species locally, but they can't raise the profile and funds for these species because mm -hmm. they're sat in Nigeria and don't know how to fundraise in the US or Europe, and no one's ever heard of the species that they're working on. <laughs> so how do you yeah. simultaneously raise their profile so that they become the face of the species whilst getting people to care about a species that they've never heard of? But the good thing with lots of these species is often it's not that expensive to save species going extinct. <laughs> Sumatran rhinos, tigers, lions, yes, it's expensive. But when you're trying to, to save an amphibian going extinct, five, ten thousand dollars $10,000 a year can stop that mm -hmm. and actually put them on the road to recovery. A primate, $20,000 a year. So you can actually save all of these species if you can just get the attention focused on them. And that's what we're yeah. really trying to do. And we, as you say, we've got an amazing comms team that, that really puts the profile of these species out there and the general issues. We recently launched a, a bit of a campaign to make sure people talk about fungi as well, because they're completely <laughs> ignored. If we talk about amphibians being ignored, then start looking yeah. at plants and then start looking at fungi. <laughs> There's lots of species yeah. <laughs> out there that are 
absolutely on the brink and with with supporting an individual you can make huge differences and there's so many passionate Mm -hmm. people out there all over the world that want to save their local species we can just give them a leg up and a platform they will do it yeah absolutely yeah it's such a great program do you have any examples of any species maybe in the last 10 15 years that were brought off the brink of extinction whether it's something that you worked with or just something that you know of that uh, kind of just in the community? Yeah, there's lots of species, thankfully. We know conservation works. You can always argue what taking something off the brink of extinction really means. But let's just bring it back to rhinos. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the white rhino was potentially down to one or 200 individuals in Mfalozi National Park in, in South Africa. There's now 20,000 rhinos across multiple countries of Africa. Huge conservation success story. Yes, there's a lot further to go, but massive conservation success story. The Indian rhino as well, down to, we think around 100 animals in India and maybe 100 animals in Nepal. Just this week, they announced the new numbers and there's now over 4,000 Indian rhinos in the wild. So we we know how to save rhinos. That's the other thing to take away is is we've done it for for black rhinos, white rhinos, Indian rhinos. These are huge conservation success stories. You can then rattle off a whole load of other species, Mauritius kestrel, Californian condor, European bison, you name it. Um, Lots of really good conservation examples, often done through a combination of conservation breeding and in the field work and combining those two approaches. But also, there's also very different ways to recover species. We do a lot of work um, on islands. And if you look to the Caribbean, for example, some really rare um, lizards there, take Redonda, for example, uh, uh, an island in the Caribbean has two endemic reptiles, which were thought to be right on the brink of extinction. Um, our partner, Fauna and Flora International, did a, an eradication of rats on the island. And two years later, these two species of, of lizard are booming. So removing a threat can lead to a massive recovery. And so, yeah, there's, there's examples from almost every country, every taxa, you name it. There's great examples of species recovery. And, and So what frustrates me a lot is is people think conservation is almost a luxury. It's not a luxury, it's a necessity, and we know how to do it. (laughs) If we could scale it up (laughs) to more species, more partners, we could get Mm -hmm. this planet back on track. Yeah, yeah, those are great examples, and I think it's just important to remind people that, you know, I feel like it can become doom and gloom talking about some of these scenarios and these species that are on the edge, but... There have been so many successes and this stuff does work if we put the effort and focus on it. So yeah, I think those are great ways to highlight it. Do you have any question that you wish people would ask you, you know, kind of in this space over your career? You know, I feel like you've probably had other interviews and things like this, but is there anything that stands out? You're like, man, I wish someone would ask me this question. That's a good question that I've never thought about. There's lots of questions I get all the time, which is how can you know Joe Bloggs on the street help or, or how can I get into conservation? And I think they're both excellent questions that every single individual on the planet should be asking themselves. Mm. I'm not sure I'm the best person to answer either of them, but I think there's questions that people should be looking inward and, and seeing what role they can play rather than me having the answer to a question like that. Yeah, I mean... Maybe not a specific answer like that, but just advice for someone that is passionate about conservation and maybe wants to make this a career. What would you tell them? I mean, I feel like you were driven from an early age, but, you know, and and sort of this, this is kind of tying into with what Rewild is doing as well, you know, and being able to empower people that, in places where they might not think they have the resources. So if you have that passion, what would you tell that person? Get out there and do it. It's not about degrees. It's about practical application. So go out, start in your own backyard, think native plants, recycle, do whatever you can in your home, but then look locally. There's probably a local conservation group looking after a patch of forest behind your house or the stream around the corner. Help them, volunteer, 
that will connect you to others that might be working at a bigger, broader scale and just get in the door, do it. It's really, really important to demonstrate your own personal commitment to it by making sure you're using your purchasing power to do the right thing. If you're buying a sponge for your kitchen, make sure it's not a plastic sponge, but it's made from natural materials. And there's more and more clothes companies out there that are making sustainable clothing. Like, Don't just necessarily go to the store down the street to buy a new jacket. Look online. There's loads of really interesting new innovative companies out there creating things that are much more sustainable. Start with yourself, start with your garden, start with your local park and build out from there. If everyone on the planet was yeah. to do that, we'd be in a much better place. Mm, yeah, really good advice. Is there anything else you want to share before we wrap this up? I would just firstly congratulate you on the movie and thank you for raising the awareness for rhinos and for rangers. Amazing species of rhinos, all five of them. Don't forget the Asian ones. <laughs> and for raising the profile of, of rangers and, and again, the, all the various hats that they, they wear. So congratulations on helping with that global push. And then to anyone listening, please just, Check out the Asian rhinos. If you like rhinos, it brings a whole set of new diversity, new challenges, new environments to the world of rhinos. So I encourage you to, to learn more about them and always happy to, to answer anyone's questions through, through the WeWorld website or any of the social media. Yeah, just please learn more about rhinos and do what you can to support them. Thank you. Yeah, really appreciate it, Barney. And thank you so much. It's been great having this conversation with you and looking forward to the next one. Great. Thank you for inviting me. It's uh, great to be with you today. Cheers. Thank you for listening to the Rhino Man podcast. If you enjoyed this episode and you're excited to see the film succeed, please subscribe and review our podcast on Spotify and iTunes. Then follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Rhino Man the Movie. More details about Rhino Man, the social impact campaign, and future screenings are at rhinomanthemovie.org. To learn more about the Global Conservation Corps and their work, visit globalconservationcorps.org. Sign up for the newsletter and follow GCC on all of the social platforms. If you like this podcast, make sure to subscribe and catch up on GCC's Voices of Nature podcast, where Bob Ludke interviews a wide range of people who have dedicated their lives to making a difference in conservation. A special thanks goes out to Simone Wilson for the music for this podcast. He's the brilliant composer for Rhino Man the Movie. Learn more about his work at simonewilsonmusic.com. Until next time, I'm John Jerko, and this is the Rhino Man Podcast. <laughs>